The following program is a production of the Hennepin County Library. Hello and welcome to a discussion with Graham Bass. My name is Arlene Case. I'm a children's storyteller and bookseller for Borders Books in Minnetonka, Minnesota. Welcome. Welcome, Graham. Good day. My question for you is your books have such a wide appeal to children of all ages. Mm. What is your target audience, if you have one? Well, last year I would have said 33, and, and this year it's <laughs> 34. No, it's, it, no, honestly, it's my age. Right. Um, and when I tell people that I write for myself, it can either sound trite as if, well, you know, so what, or, or even self-centered but it's actually a very important uh, principle which, uh, it, uh, which I adhere to. I think the worst thing you can do in the world when you're talking to anybody is, is to talk down to them. Right. Or for that matter, to talk up to them. Pretend that you know things that you don't know. Just be honest, be yourself. So uh, if, if I were to you know, start saying, okay, I'm gonna direct my books to five to eight year olds and what they need is a book about trucks or spaceships sure. or something, I'd begin to sort of, uh, I suppose, limit myself and still start talking in, in what I perceive to be a childish way or, or the way that kids would, would like to be talked to, that what I think. And if I get it wrong, I'm in all sorts of trouble because as soon as a child gets the feeling that they've been talked down to, you'll just, you'll just lose their respect. So right. I write for me and I illustrate for me first and then whoever else likes it from there, that's fine. Right. <laughs> okay. okay. Now what or who inspired you to create these intricate details that you do in your books? Well, in my background is, uh, is a little mixed. I was, I was born in England, right. so, so those early influences tended to be uh, things, the, the British you know, standards like Winnie the Pooh, Wind in the Willows, oh, uh, Lewis okay. Carroll, things like that. And, yeah. and eventually, I, d I did illustrate a, a Lewis Carroll book eventually, uh, just the poem, The Jabberwocky. But then we went to Australia when I was eight years old, um, and the influences were all very, very different then. Uh, not so much uh, in books, but just in, in landscape. Uh, I suddenly discovered a new land with, with an incredible array of new animals yes. and my parents were very interested in wildlife so as soon as we went to Australia we, we started going out to the national parks into the rainforest and discovering the wildlife yeah. so it's no surprise then that my, my pictures are to do with animals. As for the detail and, and the intricacy I don't know it sort of gets a bit obsessive that I, I, I love the idea of being able to look into a picture and find more than it initially meets the eye. There were, there were pictures I remember as a kid where there would be puzzle pictures. You'd look at it and then if you looked at it again or you turned it upside down, yeah. uh, you know, there'd be some sort of puzzle or a trick to it. And I always liked pictures yeah, like that. Yeah, you see something new each time you look at Well, I at think, it. yeah, I mean, I, that, that's what I would hope would happen, say, with, with, with the books that I've done. And it has. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> well, with, with Animalia, for yes, instance, you know, sure. it, it, was, it was started off as, as an alphab alphabet book. I mean, that's what it's basically about, A to Z or Z, as you say here. Mm -hmm. uh, and... It wasn't enough though to just do A is for apple and, and B is for balloon or something like that. I wanted to do A is for all of this, everything I yeah. can think of. Yeah. Uh, so there is lots and lots of detail to be found. Yeah, well, they, they are sure exciting. <laughs> them. Now, in Animalia, you placed yourself in each one of the illustrations. Uh, now, this idea has been copied by others. For example, well, I don't know, maybe I copied from them. I don't <laughs> no, know. well, let's just assume that they copied <laughs> from you. Very generous okay. of you. Thank you. <laughs> the Waldo series is like oh, that. Yes. Are you familiar with that? I am, although in Australia it's called Where's Wally? Because oh, Waldo yes, is a right. name we don't understand. Yes, right. the Waldo series. How do you feel about that? Uh, I don't feel anything about that uh, <laughs> in, in particular. Oh, well, no, I, I don't think there was any, I mean, it's not as though it's a sort of a copyright idea. In fact, with Animalia, it was uh, uh, an afterthought. What, oh. I, what I wanted to do, see, I, I'd done the first picture, was horrible hairy hogs hurrying homeward on heavily harnessed horses. I'll show it this one here. Um, and it was, a, it was an image which I had, which I was felt very, very strongly about. I had this, this sort of, this vision of, of these huge horses galloping across a stormy landscape. I just wanted to do that picture for its own sake. Um, and having done it, I, I, I was after some sort of application for the art, some reason for having done it. So I thought, I'll, I'll call it horrible hairy hogs hurrying home yeah. on heavily harnessed horses. And then I was faced with a problem of having to do another 25 or, or, or 26 of them. Just like that. <laughs> but the little boy, uh, the reason he was there is, is, uh, is to link a lot of disparate images. I mean, every picture, uh, is, is, its, is its own sort of world. And so when I did the C page, 
I decided what I would do is, is have the same little fellow which I'd hidden uh, very uh, secretively in the H page. He appears again in the C page. He becomes a link through all of the pictures um, and serves, serves the, 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 the purpose of, of uh, getting people to begin to look. Uh, you know, th the first game that you could play with the book, you know, for instance, would be find the, the little boy. Mm -hmm. Um, and then you'll begin to see all the, the other things which are hidden in the pages. No, it certainly works because there's so many different levels that one could enjoy the book. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, this, this is right. So at a very, very simple level, it, it would just be, uh, so you might see a piece of cake. You know, down down in, in the bottom corner, there's, there's, a, there's a slice of cake just right on the side there. But yeah. it's not just, not just any cake, of course, it's chocolate cake mm -hmm. or it's chocolate cream cake. Uh, it's been cut or chopped and it's crowned with a cherry. But also it contains calories and carbohydrates and you know, <laughs> cholesterol <laughs> probably and all that sort of thing. So yeah, you can keep sort of finding new, new right. things all the time. Yeah. That's, what I, that's what I like about sort of doing this sort of work is that it, it, there is a sort of a humour to it, entertainment of, of discovering new things all the time. Coming back and suddenly dis yeah, it, finding there was something there I didn't realise. Is there almost a compulsion type of a thing to get as much as you can? Well, I've that. certainly received letters from people talking about the fact that uh, they've... Um, uh, they've sort of brought Animalia out of the dinner party and, and, and have oh. <laughs> that's the end of the conversation for the night and they've written to me sort of in, in mock anger that this has happened. Yeah, well, it is <laughs> exciting. It is. Uh, now I'd like to ask you a question about the 11th hour that was published by mm. Abrams in uh, 1989. Yeah. Can you tell us the, the process in which the ideas for this book evolved? Well, th as for where the idea came from, I'm not really sure. It was one of those right out of the blue ideas. Oh. I was actually working on another project, uh, um, a field guide to dragons of the world, which is yet to come to uh, reality. Uh, and I, it really just suddenly I thought, wow, I could do a mystery story uh, s uh, but with all the clues in the, in the illustrations rather than in the text, as would be the case with Agatha Christie, for instance. And about 15 seconds later, it seems now in, in memory, I came upon the, 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 the title, The Eleventh Hour. It just sounded like a great mystery story title. Oh, so yes. I was faced with the problem of trying to write a story to match a title rather than the other, the way, other around, way around, which okay. I presume is the norm. Okay. But so I, I, I devised the idea of 11 animals that go to an 11th birthday party on the 11th of November. And when they're there, they see this wonderful feast spread out in front of them. But they're not going to eat it until 11 o'clock, the 11th hour. So they go off and they play 11 games and finally come back into the, uh, into the banquet hall and all the feasts has vanished. And that was the mystery and all the clues I just sprinkle throughout the book. But again, at different levels. Yeah. At the simplest level, if, if you just look at it like a child, um, I think you, it can be solved really, you know, fairly quickly. I don't know how long. I, if, if I start mentioning sort of hours or minutes, I'll, I'll, ev everybody will be angry. <laughs> it took longer or shorter. But there's also very much more sort of esoteric and analytical ways of going about the, the, uh, the solving the mystery, which um, yeah, can be more enjoyable, but it's not essential. Right. I know when uh, it took me so long to solve this one. Yeah. Uh, and then I, when I, I reread it for the third and the fourth time, I was using, diff I was using different clock clues. Yeah, oh that's yes. basically how I did it through process of yeah, elimination. Of, 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 yeah, so elimination and deduction. All the way through, right. I, I keep on saying, watch the clocks. Right. You know, right. That's and important. I did. <laughs> I mean, for yeah. if you were a detective, you know, coming right. to the scene of a murder or something, the first thing you do is, you know, try and determine the time of the crime. Right. So anybody who comes to that book fresh, that would be the first thing that I would suggest that you do, try and work out when the, uh, the crime was committed, and then you've got to uh, you've got to see okay. who could have done it. So I shouldn't feel so. <laughs> I'm bad giving away too much. <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't feel so bad that it, it, it took me longer than maybe others. Are you uh, going to admit to how long it took? Or? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's all right. No, Look, I I, pe so. uh, people come to, to book signings every now and then, and they say, you know, I've been working on this for two years, and mm -hmm. I, I think, well, you're, you're doing something wrong here. It doesn't <laughs> take two years to solve the mystery. The, the criminals got away by then. Uh, how long did it take you to complete the eleventh hour from start to finish? Uh, two and a half years. Two and a half yeah, years. Yeah. Um, Again, with the sort of the detail and trying to hide all the clues, there's no way that that can be sort of just done, you know, mm -hmm. any, any more quickly. Uh, I, I'm, you know, I, I get obsessive about my work. When I'm working, I work very hard and very consistently at it. Thank but you. each picture will, you know, tend to take one, two months each to okay. get to complete. And there's lots of research and sort of uh, design work that has to go on, apart from just like colouring in. Yeah. Well, I can see they're they are almost, uh, the 11th hour in Animalia almost read like travelogues and nature logs. And then, of yeah. course, you were telling me about your background. Uh, well, with, with the 11th hour, after I'd uh, come up with the idea for the story uh, and, and the concept of the book, I started traveling you know, uh, on, on a trip through India 
and Africa and later on through Europe. And there's pictures from the book which, which uh, relate to the things which I saw. The entrance hall when all the animals first come into Horace's house is, uh, is based on St. Peter's in Rome. Yes. And then later on in the book, there's uh, a, an area which has a lot of Charles Rennie Mackintosh, the Scottish designer and architect, the, the chairs yes. in the card game. Uh, in India, I saw beautiful rugs and tapestries and stuff. So the, uh, the picture for the, with, with the snakes and ladders reflects yeah. all, all those things which I saw. So a book which started out as, you know, I mean, uh, as, as a strong idea, but a fairly simple idea, was, was expanded and, and, and fattened out by the experiences that I had. Yeah. So it's, I think it's important when, when you're writing or illustrating that the stuff really does come from within, that you don't try and think, well, I wonder what it would be like to, you know, to, to be an astronaut or something. Much better off if you can, to go up there and actually experience it. I mean, th some things aren't possible. But it, it, if, if experiences can come into a book as well as ideas and, and, and sort of imagination, it just gives it that extra roundness yeah, and yeah. it's and more it satisfying. Really you write what you know and you illustrate what you see and you incorporate the two together Yeah, it's a question sort of honesty or, yes. or integrity in the work. That's, yeah. what I, that's what I'd aim for anyway. Yes. Okay, well, it's, it's wonderful. Thank you. Now, it, my grandmother um, yeah. lives in Gula Gulch. She, yeah. she, the grandmother, is the only human uh, that I've ever drawn. That you've ever done. <laughs> I'm and not very good at it, am I? <laughs> no, pe no pe people are, are, are certainly uh, a, a problem for me. Um, when, when kids r write to me and they ask, Dear Mr. Bates, what is the hardest animal to draw? And they expect me to say, you know, a peacock or a, or a platypus or something like that. And I always write back and say, no, it's not. It, it, it's the human being. The reason being is that we know it so well. I could draw a platypus and I can get, you know, the four legs wrong and give it six fingers instead of five or something. Nobody would know the difference. Mm -hmm. if but with people, because you know the subject matter, you just get one thing wrong, you know, the, the, the position of the eyes or the length of the neck, and suddenly it's not, you know, it's, it just doesn't, doesn't look right. Yeah. So apart from that, also, I don't have a great interest in drawing people. I mean, my passion is animals, so I concentrate on it. Mm -hmm. Now, was she based on anyone you know, or is yeah. she completely imagined? No, she, she looks a lot like my maternal grandmother, oh. but she also looks a little like the lady I used to ne live next door to for a few years when I first arrived in Australia. Okay. I don't think she knows that. Okay. <laughs> uh, but no, I, I look, I have to admit to all and sundry now that Ghoulie Gulch actually doesn't even exist, neither, neither do the other places in the book, Bandy Wallop, and Lawson's Rest and Murrumbum, I made them all up, I okay. admit it. Yes. Well, I did travel to Australia and I don't remember. No, you didn't pass through them. Any of those Actually, sometimes it's, oh, yeah, I, I know Ghoulie Gulch, and I said, you do not. <laughs> 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 Always be truthful. Oh, yes. <laughs> okay. Now, in your, your next book, this was published in 89 by Abrams, Jabberwocky. Mm. Uh, this is a collaboration between you and well, Lewis Carroll's yeah, manuscript through I'm the not sure that class. it's really a collaboration since he'd been dead for seven yes, years well, before I did it. But nevertheless, yeah, his, I certainly... his manuscript yes. and your artwork. Yeah, and was this idea yours or...? The Actually, no, it wasn't. It was, it was suggested to me. I'd, I'd just finished the artwork for Animalia, which, and it was yet to come out. Mm -hmm. um, and I was just approached by another publisher who said, we'd, look, we're doing this great big series of books. There's going to be uh, uh, 200 or something in the series, just small books. Uh, and one of them is Lewis Carroll's Jabberwocky, Would You Like to Illustrate It? And I just jumped at it because I'd known this poem, seven stands of poem, off by heart since I was a child. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, that, that's, uh, that was how that one came, uh, came about. Originally, though, it was only a very small book, just a little reading scheme book. Um, and later, uh, I think perhaps when Animalia had taken off and actually uh, gained some, some success, that it was decided to, to create uh, a big book of Jabberwocky as well. I see. Well, it's a wonderful marriage between the text and the illustrations. It, it was because I was so enthusiastic about the text. That's yeah. the thing about uh, the collaborations is that what happens is the text becomes uh, the focal point. It becomes sacrosanct. You can't change it. Right. Um, right and the illustrations then uh, are subservient to some extent, uh, and that's a problem, especially if, if you don't actually quite agree that the text is, is as good as it could be. Mm -hmm. um, so when I do my own books, which, which I do now almost exclusively, yes. I, I don't collaborate as, as a rule. Um, it means that I, I, even though if I finish the text, I can still come back while I'm doing the illustrations and say, wait a sec, that verse now is unnecessary, or it would be much better if so-and-so's jacket was red instead of blue because it looks better. Mm -hmm. So I can actually you know, just br bring the marriage between the text and the illustrations just that little bit closer together. All right. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Now, your most recent book, The Sign of the Seahorse. Oop, move that one out. Okay. Now, the theme for this is about the pollution of the coral reef. And even though it's, it's sort of like in a play form, because you mm. do have a listing of your characters, yeah. 
I just felt this was a much more serious subject matter. You're talking about pollution and what's mm -hmm. happening mm -hmm. to the coral reef and the creatures that make up the reef. Now, is this something that we're going to see in your, your future works that you are a little bit more serious? I don't know. I don't oh. know. This is this. Yeah, the, the, the sign of the seahorse uh, is a departure for me in that it does have a serious message. I, yes. I, I've never, I've never wanted to sort of put a message in the book before. As I say, I mean, I write them for me, and I'm, I don't think I need to send myself messages. Well, not conscious ones anyway. But I, I'll tell you the inspiration for the book. It was my first experience of scuba diving. I'd done a lot of snorkeling and swimming coming from Australia. You tend, everybody lives around the beach. Uh, but it took a trip to Martinique uh, uh, for a holiday once for me first to try scuba diving. And when you can go underwater and stay underwater and look at the fantastic complexity of, of a coral reef, uh, that, that was what inspired, inspired the idea. Uh, but very close on the heels of that you know, aw awestruck feeling of, of elation at seeing the beauty is, is the, the knowledge that these things are beginning to disappear. That's right. Yeah. The, the, the parallels, I think, between a coral reef and a rainforest is, is a very strong one. Where I think everybody understands that when a rainforest tree is cut down, it's not just the tree that goes, it was that particular plant, parasitical plant that grew on the tree and the, and the orchid which only grew in, that, in, the, in, in the bowl of that plant and then all the birds and the insects and so forth. That's right, it's and a coral reef, Yeah, it's a complete right. habitat and, and under, under the water it's the same sort of thing. Right. So I felt moved for the first time to actually say something. What I didn't want to do was shout it from you know, the rooftops and bang a big drum in somebody's ear. The best way to make somebody t listen to you it's just a whisper, to say it very quietly. They go, what was that again? And they'll look beneath the surface. So while the sign of the seahorse is, uh, is a story of greed and high adventure in two acts, as, as the subtitle says, and you've got Pearl Trout, uh, who's a waitress at the seahorse cafe, and her true love, Bert the soldier crab, who goes off to search for the poison, and Pearl's brother, Phineas, who joins the catfish gang. And that's, it's, it's all a sort of a, a melodra melodramatic sort of, you know, a uh, rollicking story on the top. I think that it won't go past people that there is in fact a, a serious uh, thing going on beneath the surface, as it right. were. Well, after I, I read this, I thought this would make a neat book, a neat script for a play form oh. for children <laughs> to put into a school play dealing with the environment and ecology. Now, we haven't talked about this before, but that's exactly what I'm going to do. Oh! Yes. <laughs> no, seriously. Uh, the fact yeah. that it's written in, in acts and scenes, uh, there's a few yes. reasons, and, and, and if we have the time, I'll come back to it. But certainly, in my mind, right from the outset, was that be the, the, the it felt fairly dramatic. You know, as I, I mentioned the word melodrama before, and it, it seemed that uh, uh, to put it onto the stage would be a natural progression of the project. Yeah. So while I was uh, uh, illustrating the book, uh, I was I was going to the piano and writing music, writing a theme oh for Bert oh. the Soldier Crab, and or writing a love song between. Pearl and Bert, or you know, a, a, a very up-tempo number for the, for the Catfish Gang stuff like that. The other reason, though, why I wrote it in acts and scenes, uh, I originally wanted to write it as as a pure play, uh, is, is that it's a very long and it's a quite a complex story, and I felt that in order for it not to be inaccessible to to children, it needed to be uh, sort of itemized. You you needed to to give it bite-sized portions, so. The, the, uh, at, the, uh, at the beginning where it says, uh, Act One, Scene One, The Seahorse Cafe. Um, underneath it, it, it goes on to say, in which our heroine Pearl falls in love with Corporal Bert and the evil grouper pays an unwelcome visit to the cafe. Now, just that, it's like a signpost. It tells you just enough about what's going on. You look at the illustration, you could then turn to the next page. But what these, what these little subtitles also do is it invites you further other ones will say something like in which uh, da 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 da, and uh, and Pearl embarks on a long journey into the unknown, or uh, Phineas makes a startling discovery. This is a very old-fashioned sort of thing at the beginning of chapters, yeah. uh, and it invites you further in. Say for a reluctant reader who who isn't right. that keen on the idea of reading, it will say, "Come on, read me, read me," mm -hmm. but it will also give that same child or adult uh, a way of of, of short-circuiting the long text and sort of doing it in, in a simpler way. Right. Well, I, I also felt in reading it, there was a lot of emotion, each one of the characters you met, that uh, they are obviously not people, but they could be. Yeah, <laughs> yeah well, that, that, that's, that's, that's my great interest. Uh, although I'm interested in, in getting the, the animals accurate, uh, it, it doesn't go down right to their anatomy. Like I'll sit a fish up in a chair and get, in, you know, get the, the fin holding you know, a glass or something like that. Um, 
I'm, I'm more interested then in, in actually injecting humour and personality into the, into the animals. I mean, it's classic anthropomorphism, right. which goes in and out of fashion, I'm told. Uh -huh. But I mean, I've, I've never taken an awful lot of okay. notice of whether things are in fashion or not. Okay. But, well, for me, it's always in fashion and it always works. So this oh, is very, very successful. Well, it was the stuff of my childhood. I mean, Winnie the Pooh and Wind in the Willows. That's okay. really what it's all about. Okay. And the, another thing I wanted to ask you is that you always write in a rhyming text. Do you feel most comfortable in thinking and writing in a rhyming text rather than prose? Yeah, I do. People say, why do you do it? It must be very difficult. I say, no, it's actually easier. It okay. gives you some sort of format within which to work. You've got four lines in each verse in which to say something. And if you haven't said something in that four lines, you throw the verse away. So it, it keeps you, you know, very sort of <laughs> directed and focused right. at the work. Also, because I have a great love of music, it's, it's a, sort of a way out for that. The, the meter in my, in my verse tends to be very exact. I'm very careful about the musicality of, of the verse, which comes from, from the musical background, I think, as much as anything else. Uh, it, does, it does really come I to think, But kids relate to that, too. Yes, they do. Ev ev it doesn't even have to be necessarily rhyming. Uh, alliteration, such as in Animalia, uh, they, they also have a musicality, which I think kids instinctively, naturally, uh, tune into. Oh, yes. I, I think all children well, have do. that. And adults too. Some yeah, but like a lot of, lot of them lose it. <laughs> it. I mean, this is the thing, it's, it's such a shame when, when, when grown-ups think that to be grown-up you have to leave these sort of child, well, I'm glad I've childish never grown things. Up. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, well me neither. I've always made a, a distinction between being childish and being childlike. Like. Being childish is not a good thing. Being childlike is, is precious. Right. And you hang yeah. on to that. Yes, yes you do. Did you always want to write and illustrate Books. N no, uh, I originally wanted to be a commercial artist. This was just a term that I, I discovered when I was 10 or 11. Um, and I thought this sounded great. This is a way of, of drawing pictures and getting paid for it. I've seen that like the definition of the term commercial art. Mm -hmm. uh, and sure enough, I went to college, spent three years doing a graphic design course and then dutifully went out and got a job in advertising. Oh. And I hated it. I hated it with a vengeance. And what's more, they hated me. Uh, I went through three jobs in quick succession, got sacked from the third one for incompetence because I was hating the work. And if you don't like what you're doing, you don't do good work. And so that was a, a very unhappy sort of uh, revelation to me that everything that I thought I'd wanted to do, in fact, was, was, was not the case. Uh, I'd been beginning just to do some freelance work, though, in the meantime. I did uh, um, book covers and a couple of record covers and book jackets. Uh, just in the evenings, just to keep myself interested, and also my own work, just because the ideas were there. So when I got sacked, I, I just quickly got a folio of work together and started going round to the round to the publishers. So in fact, no, writing and illustrating children's books was not like you know the the great vision for my yeah. artwork, and yet I sort of fell into it after a very unhappy start in in uh, in the you know the art business, and I found it was perfect. Starting off first of all wanting to illustrate, and gradually realizing that there were, it was more satisfying and rewarding to be involved in the in the text the writing of a book as well as as well as the illustrating well, and th in this book in the sign of the seahorse to me the text is as important as the as the as the pictures although it's not as as not as sort of you know, that's not the first thing that you see i'm as interested in getting feedback about the text as about the pictures well lucky for us that you were sacked <laughs> 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 now do you organize your days home in melbourne so that you can be disciplined in your writing and illustrating? No, not really. I think in order to be, you know, to do, doing your best work, you have to be fired up and enthusiastic about it. Sometimes I go into the studio and I just look at the work and think, I can't stand the sight of this, I want to go out. And so I will, I'll, I'll just, I'll leave it and that day I won't work. As the deadlines get closer and these things do exist, yes. um, it becomes necessary to, to sort of work you know, more you know, sort of solidly and sort of push yourself through it. Uh, and then I'll do sometimes 16, 17 hour, da hour days because I'm just so enthusiastic about the work at hand. Yeah. Varies a lot. And they go very quickly for you, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, you suddenly look up, what, lunchtime already? Then suddenly it's, you know, six in the evening. And th those are good days. Sometimes oh. they drag. Okay. <laughs> do you, uh, have you been influenced at all by any contemporary artists or uh, there artists was in, in the history of art? Have they affected yeah. you? Yeah. Um, well, as, as an older student, uh, I was fascinated by the Surrealists, especially Dali and Magritte. Uh, I, I just like the humour in their work as much as anything. I'm sure lots of it is very deep and meaningful and profound, but I've never been one to get involved tremendously in, you know, in, in, in very sort of deep and meaningful things. I mean, I'm not <laughs> meaning to sound sort of light and airy-fairy, but I just I love the humour of, of those incredible juxtapositions. Then there was an English artist uh, who did a lot of record covers called Roger Dean, did a lot of uh, albums and covers for a band called Yes. 
and I was very fired up with enthusiasm when I saw those because they were fantastic imaginary landscapes. At the same time, I was reading Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, ah. which, I mean, you know, talk about expanding one's imagination and vision, yes. and that was very influential yeah, on me as well. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. How long did it take you to complete Animalia? Animalia was a three-year project. Uh, the first year was a little bit erratic time-wise. I was, I was playing in a rock band at the time, and oh. I just met my future wife. She was the lead singer in the band, uh, so I was spending a lot of time on the music as well, and, and, and also doing freelance work, trying to earn rent money. Uh, but the, the, the main project in hand was, was the Animalia project, although at that time it wasn't even called that, it was called an Animal Alphabet and other intriguing illustrations, which is an incredibly bad title. Um, uh, for the next two years, though, after that first year, uh, I got interest from an American publisher, Abrams, to do an American uh, edition. Uh, so it, you know, it seemed to be, it was a definite project that would go ahead. I'd really just started it just because I wanted to illustrate things after this terrible time in advertising. It was just an outflowing of, of, uh, of my own creativity. And the fact that in the end the book just took off and, and um, even today it's still, it's still printing. The oh, American, yes. uh, the, in 1992, the, uh, the, fir the, the American print run hit the 30th r r reprint. Um, I just can't believe it, and that's in you know, five years or something. So it just seemed I must be doing something right. I, because I was just following my own creative nose, uh, it, 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 uh, it, it was just something that other people just seemed to, to click with, and, and that oh. was uh, sort of icing on the cake for me. Oh, yes. Yeah, <laughs> can you tell us if you're working on another project right now? Right now, it's turning the sign of the seahorse into an underwater operetta, a musical for kids. Um, and I think 1992 will be, uh, 1993 will largely be involved in that project. Following that, yes, I do have another idea. I'm not going to tell you an awful lot about it. It oh. should. Be, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I really can't. It's, it's, it's just one sort of strong visual idea. Uh, the text is liable to be minimal. Uh, the subject matter will be again animals, very much to do with nature and org organic forms. Um, it's, a, it's a very ambitious project, I can tell you that oh. much, and should be finished 95, 96. They just take a long time, I'm yes, afraid. Yes. I can't speed up. Well, it's worth waiting for. Thank I you. Yes, very much so. Uh, you talked about your reaction to the success before of, of your books. Uh, has it changed you in any way, your, your lifestyle? Uh, <laughs> well, I th no, I mean, they, they've been a financial success, there's no secret. Yeah. Um, and what that's done mostly is given me the freedom to say, you know, the next project that I do, for instance, the musical, I mean, I don't think there's any pot of gold at the end of this. This is just something that I really want to do. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I'm able, I've, I've got the luxury of being able to spend a year doing something like that. Uh, I don't have to look for the next, you know, the next paycheck, the next thing which is going to, you know, earn me, earn me some money or be the next step along a career. I'm not really concerned about that. I'm, I'm very, very lucky in that. But uh, I think if, if, uh, if financial success can, 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 be can be the source of creative freedom, uh, you couldn't ask for more. Uh, yes. okay. Do you discuss any of your ideas why they're in the formative stage? Oh, oh, well, with my publishers and especially with my wife, she's trained uh, in fine art. Uh, she has a great sense of color and design. And also in, in the musical side, as I said, she was the lead singer in the band. We used mm -hmm. to write music together. So she, yeah, after myself, she's the, the first line. Now she's up in the firing line as a critic, but also as a very, very good critic with wh whom I can trust uh, entirely. Yeah, no, she's very wonderful. important, that's oh, for sure. Oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> it's wonderful to be able to share that. It must be very exciting. It is. Oh. It, yeah, yeah, there's, there's nothing like it. I mean, I work in a vacuum. I work for myself and by myself, and having somebody else is very important. Okay. Well, I believe our time is up, and I want to thank you on behalf of the discussion with, and I want to thank all our viewers out there for joining us today. <laughs>